Okay, class. So this is the second half of the quantitative genetics PowerPoints lecture, which is titled Lecture 15 in the PowerPoint slides. And we're going to call this Lesson 20 uh, because this is the 20th like recording I've done on these these PowerPoint uh, lectures. So this uh, end of this lecture will conclude everything that you need to know for exam two, uh, which is coming up in uh, a couple weeks. So um, anyway, uh, this will give you all the information you need to finish that problem set um, and also the quiz, the quantitative genetics quiz. All right, so we left off talking about um, heritability, right? And we talked about narrow sense heritability, and we talked about broad sense heritability, and we talked about um, how we can use that to determine uh, how heritable uh, something genetically is versus environmentally. And again, this would be uh, if you wanted to, uh, you know, grow, grow bigger chickens because they make bigger chicken breasts so you can sell them uh, more easily, then you would want to know if I take two big chickens and mate them together, are their offspring going to have big chickens or will it not matter? Because if it doesn't matter, why would I bother wasting my time doing that? or strawberries or anything any, like any agricultural product I mean then you know this could be in humans too like what like what uh, it might not matter if so if you want to have a tall kid and there is no heritability due to tallness then you wouldn't uh, need to care who your spouse is but if but if it is then you would want to have children with a tall individual and same thing with intelligence so we can we can use this to figure out complex traits um, and remember the most important thing the most useful thing for uh, individuals that are you know agriculture or farming is going to be narrow sense heritability which is this h little h uh, squared because the other things that are involved like epigenetics and and uh, dominance and stuff like that may not have as big of an impact as the additive effect right we're adding traits to you know alleles together to increase it just like the bird example so with the bird example the the dominance trait only showed if that uh, well it didn't show for everyone it only showed for the heterozygotes and the homozygous dominance and they got the same score so you wouldn't be able to select that between those two but here you can't because it's all additive <clears throat> okay ahead here I'm going the wrong way yeah okay so we can we can look at things and remember our our original question was is that we wanted to get you know a certain weight of pumpkin seeds and we have a certain known uh, that we began with and so if we're doing selection experiments we want to look at the the average weight of our original uh, population of pumpkin seeds then we want to look at the average or the mean of individuals selected to be the parents so in our previous example and I'm just gonna have to remind myself of this let's see yeah so the mean seed in the population the mean seed weight is 100 milligrams uh, we want to get to 125 so we selected parents that are 140 so these are the things that you need to do 
to um, utilize this to figure out what the how to get to that selected weight of pumpkin seeds that agricultural people buyers are paying for so we need to know the the mean you know in this case the weight of pumpkin seeds are the ones that we select to the parents and the mean of the next generation like if we want them to get those pumpkins to be 125 uh, milligrams or whatever that was then we need to know all this stuff and then all of this is related to Narasense heritability remember Narasense heritability is <clears throat> let's see VA divided by VP so Narasense heritability this is the equation this is the variation due to the additive effect and this is the variation due to all phenotypic effects so uh, additive uh, dominance uh, epistasis environmental epistasis and environmental <clears throat> everything that include that everything that contributes to the phenotype so it this is a formula that we can use to plug this in to get uh, an answer to our question so in this case the denominator is called the selection differential the difference between the mean of the parents and the mean of uh, the population right which is the original mean that means all the pumpkins uh, so the difference between total population and individuals selected to be parents in the next generation which is what I just said the numerator is called the selection response so it's the difference between the offspring the next generation mean and again the original mean the mean of the population so we can just plug this in and we just plug it into our equation so here's our sample problem that i just went back to um, and so we want to plug in these numbers we want to know what is the mean weight of the next generation of pumpkin seeds we need to figure out narrow sense heritability because that's the next generation minus the original divided by the selected minus the original uh, so in this case selected means the parents um, but we don't know the next generation mean weight so we have to calculate that all right so this is how we do it so we know this is our equation sorry I'm, this drawing pad is way far away from my computer so it's freaking me out a little bit uh, it's hard to get my hand straight here but anyway, nearest to terrorability, like I said, is the additive variance uh, divided by the phenotypic variance. Remember, the phenotypic variance, like I said, is all these things. I'm not including uh, epistasis or uh, environmental uh, epistatic interactions. So we just have additive dominance in environmental. So we're going to get 8 squared equals the VA divided by all these values. And we solved for VA earlier in slide 39. So let's just go back to remind you that here we solved that VA, where are you? There you are. VA equals 400. So we already know that value. And this is how we derived it. <clears throat> Okay, so the genetic variance is the additive and the dominance. We know that the genetic variance is 105 because we were told uh, that it is, sorry, 605, because we were told that it is 605. So we know that this value is 605. We already calculated this uh, value earlier, um, and so we we need to. F uh, I mean, we could calculate it here because we have this value of two hundred five, which is right here. 
So we could calculate it, but we already did, and it's 400, and we plug it in. So uh, we have uh, 400, right, nearest sense heritability is uh, VA divided by all of these. So VA 400 plus um, 205, which is the VD right here. And then 95, this is writing on the actual slide, so I'm going to have to delete this. Anyway, uh, 95 is environmental variance, so plus the VE, and we get 0.57. All right, so let me erase all this so it's not all, hopefully this erase is on every slide. Come on. Oh, it's only going to erase where I wrote it. Wait, I just wrote that there. All right, I'm going to pause this one to get a new PowerPoint up. So yeah, I got the slides back. Um, I don't know what this is going to do if I write on this slide, but anyway, we know H2, right? So H2 equals 0.57. We derived that from the previous slide here. Uh, Narrow sense heritability, little h squared, I should say. Uh, so this is, should be squared. Remember, we have broad sense heritability, which is big H squared, which is a little different. So we plugged all this in. We can plug this into this value, so we know that 0.57 equals X. We don't know the next generation mean weight of the pumpkin seeds. We do know that the original mean is 100 milligrams. We also know that the parent uh, parent's weight of seeds we're using are 140 milligrams. And we know the original mean again is 100 milligrams. So we take x minus 100 milligrams divided by 40. 140 minus 100 is 40. And so if we rearrange that, we divide both sides by, or we multiply both sides by 40 because this is divided by. So we multiply both sides by 40 milligrams times 40 milligrams. And we get 40 milligrams times 0.57 equals X minus 100 milligrams. So if we want to solve for X, we just add, add 100 milligrams to each side. This is basic math, basic algebra. And we come up with this value. So the next generation should be 122.8 milligrams. And so we could also substitute these, this value here for the parents to try to get closer to our goal weight, which is 125. We're pretty close. Uh, the closer we get to that, the more money we get. And that's how you do, that's how you predict uh, weights uh, or phenotypes of future generations using narrow sense heritability. Okay, so here's another sample problem. Um, and then there's some, I think, on your problem set too. So the mean number of bristles on the thorax, which is the top of the fruit fly, Drosophila, is 6.4. So that the average mean is average. The average number of bristles on the thorax of a fruit fly is 6.4. From this population, a group was chosen which had an average bristle number of 7.2. So remember, this is the parents. This is the population. <clears throat> so the offspring of the chosen group had an average of 6.6 .6 bristles. So this is the offspring. And we should be able to calculate narrow sense heritability because we have all the values that we need to calculate that. Remember, narrow sense heritability is the mean next generation from the mean original 
uh, and the mean selected, right? This is the parents. We select the parents minus the mean original, which is the population. So we plug all this in. Oh, he did it to me. Um, all right, let me get rid of this. Okay, clean it up. And so um, you guys can work that out on your own. It's not very hard, right? So we're going to plug it in. Nerissen's heritability. Mean of the next generation is 6.6. .6. Mean of the original is 6.4, which is here. This is the offspring. This is also 6.4. And then the mean of selected is 7.2. Those are the ones that we chose, we selected. And then just plug it in. It's not that hard. All right. Uh, so I bet this is going to show up on the next slide. No, it didn't. Nice. OK, so this is a summary of equations that you're going to need to know for the test. There is a list of equations that I posted on the home page of Canvas at the very bottom. Um, these formulas you're more than welcome to print out and use on the next exam. You just have to show, this is for my online class, uh, you just have to show the uh, equations to the screen before and after you uh, take the exam to uh, just to make sure that you haven't added any equations or anything so these are the equations that you can use you don't need to memorize these you just need to know what all the the, the um, variables are for these equations and then this is an example of some of them okay so We've already talked about that, but I just want to make sure everybody understands this. So, narrow sense heritability is equal to the slope of the regression of offspring. So, um, we talked about this uh, a little bit earlier. Um, so, let's say this is the height of mom and this is the height of dad. And so, a short dad and a short mom have a short kid. And as the dad and mom get bigger, the kids get taller. And so if there's a one-to-one -one ratio, it's 100% correlated. The, the slope, the heritability, Nerissen's heritability is one. Um, you know, you... This is the slope intercept. So it's Y equals MX plus B. And then heritability here, if it was, if it didn't matter, let's just say you had random kids. So this is a short, uh, a tall mom and a short dad. It's here uh, or here or he, you know, tall mom, short dad. Uh, you have uh, tall mom, tall dad, right? This is increase in height. And they're right here. So the, so all of these, if we try to draw a straight line through it, it's zero. So there's no correlation uh, between the parents and the phenotype of the offspring. So the phenotype of mom plus the phenotype of dad divided by two is this value. <clears throat> all right. Um, so as this changes, right, the Nerissen's heritability, we have a complete slope of one. It's completely heritable. Um, so everything is due to additive uh, genetics. And then this one, uh, it, only half of, the, of it is contributed to, gen, uh, to the additive effect. So the rest of it is due to other things like dominance and epistasis and so on. And then if the slope is zero, then it, it, nothing. All right, so we talked about this, y equals mx plus b, simple math, right? You can figure out that in this case, we can figure out the rise to run, and we can tell from the graph without calculating anything that this value, rise to run, is 0.49. So it's 49% heritable, narrow sense heritability. And this could apply for broad sense heritability too. Uh, but 
that formula is different, right? That's the genetic variance divided by the phenotypic variance. So in a broad sense heritability, we include all of the genetic components, not just the additive. In narrow sense heritability, we only include the additive um, component. So anyway, this is this one is the more common one, narrow sense heritability. And this is just to give you an example. So, you know, here's the heritability. It's either one or zero or anywhere in between. So you can see body weight is, you know, somewhat heritable. So you might care uh, what size the chickens are and breed them with other chickens. And you can tell who contributes more, mom or dad, by looking at the, the line itself. Uh, maybe you want to look at, uh, well, actually you can't because you're adding mom and dad and dividing by two. So you're taking an average of the two. So you couldn't get a value over one. Um, maybe the width of the breast doesn't matter, right? It's not very heritable at all. So maybe you don't want to run around catching chickens with, uh, wide breasts or breast angles because it doesn't matter uh shoot so egg weight right it's heritable the yolk weight doesn't matter right the weight of the the yolk is not her not very heritable like it's probably 0 0.1 whereas egg weight is is pretty heritable and so these are the kind of things that you would use uh, narrow sense heritability for Okay, so that brings us to the most complicated thing of all, which is QTL or quantitative trait loci. Uh, a locus, like remember, so locus is location, the location of a gene on a chromosome that's involved in the variation of a quantitative trait. Uh, so that's what basically this does is it maps what traits may be involved or what gene may be involved in a certain trait. So the basic idea behind this is very similar to the genetic mapping that you've already done and you did practice on that in the previous problem set. Um, it, and when we did two or three uh, locus mapping problems, uh, we were dealing with like discrete traits. Uh, QTLA mapping, we're dealing with like quantitative traits. So lot, lots of traits, right? Not, we're not talking about just like three genes, like in skin color. We're talking about uh, like very complex traits, like height in humans, right? There's lots of genes. And so that's much more quantitative than say, you know, 164th or, you know, there's only like eight, eight groupings. We're talking about like super quantitative traits, like you could have a person that's five foot five or 5.51 or five. So you have this gigantic range of variables in here. <clears throat> and so what QTL mapping does is it identifies the locations of these loci, the, the locus on a chromosome by using genetic linkage mapping and these genetic markers, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms and microsatellites. And then it looks at the statistical association between the marker genotype and the phenotype. Uh, to do this, there's a lot of F2 uh, and back crossing. So F2 uh, crossing back uh, to the, so we have a back cross of the offspring to the parents. So, uh, we go F2 and then back to F1, F2 back to F1, or F1 back to the parentals. Um, and so when we do that, we can get a, a QTL, that marker that's closely associated to that trait. And so I'm going to, it's hard to explain this. So uh, someone else has done a much better job of this. And so I'm going to, it kind of explain this and then I'll show you a video. So let's say that we have QTL mapping of fruit weight and tomatoes. We have large fruit and we're going to cross that with small fruit so that it can be anywhere in between. But the strains are different. 
at at markers, right? So we look at the markers. Remember, uh, mark important genes that uh, go with the markers because of that uh, hitchhiking effect. So we uh, l we can look at those markers. We can run them on a gel. We can score them. Um, and then we look at the F1 hybrid. So it, usually the F1 has intermediate fruit and it's heterozygous for the DNA markers. Oops. Um, so some are going to have markers for the small strain. Some individuals will have markers for the large strain. If we measure the weight of the fruit and score those markers in enough uh, of the offspring, uh, then most of those combinations of like the small, in this case, fruit versus large fruit, uh, will will find that in different individuals. Okay, so this is just a tomato example. Um, it's from your book. So there's a big tomato called the Beef Master, and there's a small tomato called the Sun Gold, right? And you've probably seen these at the grocery store. Big tomatoes, little tomatoes. And if we cross them together, the F1 is intermediary between the two, which is what we have already looked at and we expect. So we're going to back cross the F1 back to the big. And when we do that, we're going to get a range of fruits for you know this is the f2 and this is bc stands for back cross plants so we're going to get a range of those plants um, we can use a, a procedure called multiple regression to look for associations between fruit size and individual markers um, those markers are associated with high fruit weight statistically um, then those are the genes that are affecting fruit weight, right? Because we can look at the markers and know what genes are involved in fruit weight because the markers are going to be close to that. Um, if we have a large number of markers, then this mapping can be very precise and we can eventually identify genes that affect fruit weight. So this is very powerful uh, techni techniques. <coughs> to to help us figure out what genes are involved in a very complex trait like say schizophrenia or um, human height or other complex diseases like uh, I, I don't know I can't think of anyone right now but things that involve a lot of genes so uh, we have the parents like the tomatoes we have a small, we'll just say small is on the left, big is on the right. Small, big. We get offspring on the F1 that are intermediary. And then if we cross it back to the big parent, we're going to get uh, a range of fruit uh, between the, the two. All right, variation in a QTL, so Q and little Q and big Q alleles at this locus contribute to the phenotypic variation at the back cross generation which is the f2 remember back cross is this going back to the parent um, so let's just say this is the parent right this is the gene that makes you have big fruit and these are the alleles uh, big q big q and here's the gene again that makes you have big fruit and these alleles here are for little fruit little q little q we get a mix, right? Little Q, big Q. Because it's um, a quantitative trait, we get a range. We don't get just one phenotype. And then we back cross, and we're going to get uh, phenotypes for little Q, big Q, which are going to be over here. And we're going to get phenotypes with big Q, big Q, which are going to be over here. And they're all going to be included in this subset. In, in, in this case, we can't see the effect of little Q or big Q in this population, right? Because they're all mixed together. They overlap.
Okay, so if a genetic marker, uh, let's just say little m and big M, so we're gonna we're gonna plot it here on the chromosome. The inbred line is the one that's back crossed over and over again, right? So we, I'll show you that we need an inbred line because we need to be able to determine uh, when we're doing a test cross, we need to know the genotype of that tester, just like we did before. Um, and so this one is Q, big Q, big Q, and big M, big M. And I did a problem set that you kind of have to do by hand to figure out what happens whenever you keep uh, back crossing uh, individuals. Because in the end, like, and I've said this before, you're going to end up with a, a purebred strain, an inbred strain that's all going to be genetically identical to one another. And it takes about 20 generations to do that. Okay, so let's say we're looking at this marker right here, and we have little m, little m, big m, big m, and we know F1 is going to be like that, and we already talked about that this is going to be big. So we can't t tell the difference between the markers, right, and the back cross generation. And the and the the QTL the the quantitative trait like the actual gene that's next to it, right? Same thing. They're going to go together because they're important. That they're hitchhiking. Okay, so if the genetic marker is distantly located to the QTL, right, it's far away, then you are going to have no statistical association between the marker types and the back cross because we have uh, crossing over events between these like we talked about so you're, you're not going to be able to tell the crossing over events here we're going to get two distinct subsets um, these right here, the phenotypes big M and big M are going to be uh, separate, right? A different peak than the ones that are heterozygous, which are going to be over here. So we can distinguish this because the markers are closely associated because we can distinguish one group, the group with big M, big M, right? This is the marker from the group with little m, little m, which is the marker. And because of that, we can we know that this is probably involved in since the, since they they don't there's no crossing over so they're not uh, one continuous variable here. We can distinguish this peak blue from this peak red. Then we know that these are closely associated. I don't know what I just, what I just moved, but. If they're distant, right, we got a lot of crossover events, you're not going to be able to distinguish between the two. So whenever you plot out uh, a bell-shaped curve, they're going to overlap each other almost completely. And so that's not interesting, right, because we know that, that if the marker's not going with this, then it's not, uh, it's not associated with it. And we can tell. So, like I said, we can... Here's some examples. Um, I was going to mention diabetes, but schizophrenia for sure. We don't know what causes that. Psoriasis, heart defects, hypertension. All these can be analyzed through QTL mapping to discover genes that are involved in these phenotypic effects, including cancer. Um, it just as a disclaimer, you can't use QTL things that have uh, a low penetrance because that uh, you're not going to see the phenotypic effects, which makes sense. All right. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video on by Dan Gaddy uh, of Jackson Laboratory, which says it on the screen, of how to do QTL mapping. Um, I'm going to need to turn my sound off so that it doesn't echo. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to mute this. Um, and 
And so uh, I don't I don't expect you guys to know this. I'm just showing you how this works. It's pretty cool. Remember, we have a population that's genetically identical and inbred. Um, and then we have a population that uh, is genetically different. And so remember, we have uh, traits that are in, uh, controlled by environmental factors. And then we have traits that are controlled by genetic factors. So what we want to do is find out what the genetic factors are. And if all the mice are identical genetically, then we won't know that. But we need mice that are genetically identical to start this process because we're doing a test cross. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so my screen is muted. Let's see. Oh, the other thing I want to tell you is that uh, remember, if you're trying to find a mar if a marker is closely associated with a QTL, like you know S and P or microsatellites or whatever, and and so they're close, not a lot of crossing over, you have to do a mean and a variance on that to find out if they're two distinct means or not. So if they're the same means, that means that the markers are not closely associated to the QTL. If they're distinct means with a distinctive, not very overlapping uh, variance, then that means that they're closely associated with the QTL uh, marker. The, the marker is associated with the QTL, the gene that's involved in these complex traits. Okay, so let's see. We can start this. I won't be able to hear the sound, but hopefully you guys can. Um, My name is Dan Gaddy. I'm not really going to do any math here or any kind of instruction about how to do QTL mapping. I'm just going to try to give you an, an intuition for what it involves. So quantitative trait locus mapping is just a method to find genes that are related to some trait that you're interested in. Um, say cholesterol levels. Maybe you want to understand, gee, why are cholesterol levels high in some people and low in others? Um, so. <sighs> One of the ways that you, you, you can do that is you can pick what you're going to control. And there's the environment and, there is, and there's your genetic background. So you might imagine that um, if you had um, a bunch of mice, for example, and they were all identical twins, that would mean that their genomes were all exactly the same. And then you could give you know some of the mice cheeseburgers and feed some of the mice salads and you know some of them would have high cholesterol and some of them would have low cholesterol. Well, the reason why would be you know obviously the environment because the genetics are the same. Every single one of those mice has the same genome because they're all clones of each other. But the way that we do QTL mapping is the other way around. What we do is we try to control the environment. We feed all the mice the same diet. We put them in the same cages, the same number of hours of daylight and darkness. And we try to set up mice that have different genetic backgrounds. And so when you control the environment and control their diet and the genetic background of all the mice differs, that means that you know, the genes have to be controlling the differences in cholesterol levels. And what we do is we use the genotypes of the different mice to try to find genes that regulate, you know, or, or that, that, that explain why some mice have high cholesterol and some have low cholesterol. And ideally, that will, of course, translate over into humans. So um, let's say that we start out with two inbred founder strains, strain A and strain B. And what I've got here is I've got a pair of um, chromosomes for strain A that are always going to be colored red, and I've got a pair of chromosomes for strain B that are always going to be colored blue. And what we could do is we could mate A with B to produce what's called an F1 generation. So what happens when you do this is each one of the mice that um, come from this breeding gets one chromosome from mom, here's the red, and here's the red, and one chromosome from dad. This blue one goes over here, and this blue one goes over here. So all of the mice in the F1 generation are heterozygous for A and B. They all have one red chromosome and one, one, sorry, one copy of the red chromosome and one copy of the blue chromosome. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to mate these two mice together. 
And when we do that, we get what's called an F2 generation. Now, what's happened now is these chromosomes have, um, have crossed over, and then some of them have been picked to go into this particular mouse. And as you can see, part of each chromosome is red and part of it is blue. So that's one of the mice that come from this breeding. The other mouse, in, or the next mouse in the, the litter, had a different set of recombinations and a different set of chromosomes that got passed on. And so it's got a different genome, although it's still composed of red and blue. And so say that what we end up with is a litter of, uh, of eight mice. You can see that each one of these mice has a different mixing of the A and the B strains. So the next important concept is that um, if we look at these mice, at each SNP, they can be put into different groups. We have eight mice. But if we sit here and we take a look at SNP number one, and remember, a SNP is just a signpost along the genome, and it's located right here on the, the, this chromosome, we can look at what the genotype of each mouse is. So the genotype of mouse number one is red, red, and that means that it's AA. Genotype of mouse number two is blue, blue. That means that it's BB. Here it's blue and red. That means that it's AB. And if you keep looking all the way across, you can see this one is AB, this one's BB, AA, and so on. So that means that if we were to try to put these mice into three different groups, um, AA, AB, and BB, this mouse, Oops. This mouse and this mouse would all be in the AA group. This mouse, this mouse, and this mouse would all be in the BB group, and these last two would be in the AB group. At SNP number one, that's going to change when we move on to SNP number two. SNP number two is right here. At SNP number two, um, the first mouse is now AB because it's blue and red. Before it was AA. Um, by the same token, um, mouse number two is also AB. Mouse number three, red and blue, AB, red and blue, AB. Uh, this one is BB, and so on. So you can see now that if we tried to group the mice into three different groups, they would fall into different sets. And finally, if we go to SNP number three, once again, we have a different pattern. If we were to group them into th three different groups, these two now would be AA. These three here would be BB, and the rest of them would be AB. So the most important thing to take away from like this slide is depending on what location you're at in the genome, that decides how you can group the mice. So let's say that we do want, want to try to find genes that are related to um, cholesterol level. What I could do is I could take a set of, say, 50 mice, and I could plot them along the x-axis here, and I could plot all of their cholesterol levels along the y-axis. So some of them would be low, some of them, sorry, some of them would be high, and some of them would be low. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to scoop all of them over here onto the right-hand side. And this is the variation in cholesterol levels that we, we observe. And remember, we've controlled the, 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 the environment. These mice don't have high cholesterol levels because some of them are, are eating a high fat diet and others a low fat diet. We're controlling all of that. So most of this variation is most likely due to differences in genetic background, those mixes of red and blue genomes. And what we want to do in QTL mapping is we want to explain this variation. So we, we, we want to find a SNP or a region of the genome that helps us explain why you know, these mice have high cholesterol levels and why these mice have low cholesterol levels. And that's the point of QTL mapping, or that's our, our goal. And here's how we actually do that. So once again, I've got um, a set of mice, and I've got all of their cholesterol levels plotted. And down here on um, at the bottom, along chromosome 1, I've got um, a bunch of values that I'm going to get to plotted from 0 megabases all the way to 200 megabases. Um, along the y-axis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the LOD score, which is a measure of the statistical significance of the 
of the test that we're going to be doing at each SNP. So I'm going to start out here at SNP number one, which is located right here. And what I'm going to do is, like I did a couple of slides earlier, I'm going to break all the mice up into three different groups, depending on who has AA, AB, and BB. So I'm going to, whoops. So I'm going to take the AA ones and I'm going to color them red and move them over here. I'm going to take the AB mice and color them gray. And I'm, I'm going to take the BB mice and color them blue. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit a line to all these points. Okay. So you can see that this line is kind of flat. And if you just look at that by eye, there really doesn't seem to be much of a difference between the AA group, the BB group, and, and the AB group um, in terms of cholesterol levels. So we, we would assign this a low LOD score, which is just a low level of statistical significance, because this SNP sure isn't explaining the variation in cholesterol levels. Now I'm going to go to another SNP, and it's located right here, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. But remember, this time I'm at a different SNP, so the, the mice are, are going to, sorry, so the mice are going to break up into different groups. So I'm going to put the AAs over here, the ABs in the middle, and the BBs over here. And once again, I'm going to fit a line. Huh. So now we've kind of got an upward slope here. And it looks like, you know, there's some evidence that if, you, if mice that have the BB genotype at this lo location have slightly higher cholesterol levels, and mice that have the AA genotype have slightly lower cholesterol levels, but it's not really perfect. These mice still have kind of high levels, and these mice still have kind of low levels. But it's getting better. So we're, gonna, we're going to assign it a higher level of statistical significance. Now we're going to go over here to the last SNP, which is right here. And this is located directly underneath this peak. Once again, we're going to break the mice up into the AA group, the AB group, and the BB group. And we're going to fit a line. OK, now this looks really good. This is the kind of thing that we're actually looking for. Mice that have the BB genotype all seem to have high cholesterol levels. Mice that have the AA genotype all seem to have low cholesterol levels. And mice that have the AB genotype are somewhere in the middle. And it's a nice, tight fit. So we would give this a high level of statistical significance. And that's most of the intuition behind QTL mapping. So I did this on one chromosome, chromosome 1. But we've got 19 chromosomes and the, the X chromosome. So I could do that across all of these chromosomes, and I would get a QTL plot for the entire genome. So what I have now is the same thing I, I had be before. I, I've got the LOD score plotted on the y-axis for chromosome 1 all the way through chromosome X. And as you can see, um, for this uh, simulated example, there's a strong peak on chromosome 1. So zooming back in then on chromosome 1, what you'll be able to do in RQTL is you'll be able to get a confidence interval or a support interval around the QTL peak. It's important to realize that the actual gene of interest might not be right here underneath the, this peak. It might be a little bit to one side. And you can get an actual support interval from RQTL. In this case, it's going to be from 171 to 178 megabases. And so now what we can do is we can look at the genes in, in that region. Um, what this next plot shows is, I'm going to start up top here because there's kind of a lot of information. Up top it shows um, all of the, or it shows, sorry, the confidence interval region on chromosome 1 from about 171 megabases to 178 megabases. And what we've got here up top is we're plotting the SNPs for strain A versus strain B, because those are the two strains that we use to make these mice. In, um, in this region here, it seems to be all um, white, which is one of the two alleles, whereas strain B seems to have a lot of the gray alleles. So the two strains are actually quite different. Whereas if you look in the rest of this region, oh, it looks really like A and B are quite similar. So looking at this kind of a plot, I would guess that my gene is most likely lying in this region here to the left as opposed to on the right. 
Um, what I've got below this is all of these orange bars are snips where the two um, strains differ, and there are still a, a whole bunch of, uh, of, uh, of snips in this region where they, they actually differ. Below this, I've got the QTL plot, but um, it's the LOD score, but instead of um, a line going up and down, Black means low and red means high. So imagine this is a, a little mountain of red coming out towards you. And then below that, I've got all of the genes in this region from the Mouse Genome Informatics database. And there's 139 genes. So this is the point where most of you will probably be able to get um, during this course, where you'll start out with the entire mouse genome all 25,000 genes, and you'll do your data analysis and get down to 140 genes. 140 genes sounds like a lot, but it's a lot better than 25,000. And the next steps would involve a variety of um, bioinformatics techniques and um, just um, research in PubMed to try to look at these genes and see which one or, or ones uh, might plausibly influence cholesterol levels. And so that's sort of Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. The last part is probably echoey, so because I wanted to see when he finished this. <coughs> so that's kind of an overview <coughs> excuse me, of how we can use QTL mapping um, to determine complex traits. Okay, so um, we can see by looking at a, a group of markers, uh, and this is in your uh, problem set two, uh, which ones are closely associated? So this is the AT repeat, the microsatellite. Remember AT, AT, 87 times, CA five times, and then this is AT 10 times and CA eight times. So we have all of these markers and we have genotypes. So we have genotypes of the individual. This is AT7 and AT10. Right, it, this is I got from their mom. This is I got from their dad, or vice versa. This one, they're both tens. This one is five and eight, and then these are both eight. So we want to build a curve based on these. And so let's see. There I am. So let's let's look at this one. We have a mean. Let's just say that this is zero, and this is 10, and this is 20, and this is 30, and this is 40 over here. So uh, for this one, we know the mean is 25 right here. So we can plot it. And then we know that the standard deviation, right, the square root of the variance is plus or minus 4. So it's going to start here. It's going to go up and it'll come back down at 29. So this is the plot of AT7 and 10. And then we look at this one, AT10. So that's mean is 26, which is right here. And so it's standard deviation is four. So let's change colors. And we'll say this is green. So it's gonna be the mean is here, and it is going to occur right here. So there isn't a lot of difference. We don't see much variation in the means of these. And now let's look at this the CA locus, this uh, sorry CA microsatellite. So I'll use a different color for this, and there it is. So we're going to have this mean is twenty, and its standard deviation is three. So we're going to go out three places on each side, and we can plot this here, and then we can do the same thing here. So this mean is 29. Uh, we'll use a different color. So it's going to be here. That's not very much different. Um, let's try it out. Okay, so this is the 29. Uh, standard deviation is 4, so plus or 4 off of this. And so we plug that out. And so the question is, uh, in the back cross generation, the, the, the phenotypic distribution among the offspring are given with this data set. 
So which of these markers is most closely related to the QTL affecting the bristle number uh, of these flies, fruit flies? And so remember, uh, we have C and A. These are very distinct from each other. This is one, this is the other. So we have d distinct means. The standard deviations don't overlap at all, or they overlap very little. This one, they don't overlap at all. These two right here, their means and standard deviations cause them to overlap right here. And so if we go back and look at this, so we have, in this case, we have two distinct means, right? And so that means that these are closely related, whereas we have ones that are not distinct here and they overlap and so these are distantly related so if we go back to the question which one of these uh, which one of these are most closely related and so the closely related ones are going to be the ones that have genetically or distinct phenotypes means and standard deviations that don't overlap very much and so the answer would be CA microsatellite is more closely uh, linked to the QTL than the AT, which is right, shown right here. So the, so the ones that overlap are distantly re uh, located to the QTL right there. Okay, so here's another sample problem uh, that you guys can do on your own. Um, and uh, and that will help you practice for the exam. So see if you can solve these questions um, and then use this uh, lecture as a guide. And that's it. So that covers everything for quantitative genetics and everything that's going to be covered on the second exam. Um, there also, I just want to point out that there are some slides uh, on, on if you scroll down in Canvas from the home screen uh, close to the bottom. Um, let's see. Where is this? So it has uh, study guides for the exam um, where it says exam study guides and it also has PowerPoint reviews for the exam and then there are uh, TA notes for the PowerPoint reviews too. So there, there are actually two different, um, well there's a the slide review and then a, a video review of the PowerPoints and I just realized that these are not um, published so let me publish this. Okay, so I I thought these were published, but there's exam two uh, review for PowerPoint slides under exam PowerPoint reviews in Canvas in the homepage. Um, and then there's a video on the review for exam two and also TA notes for that exam. So uh, make sure you take a look at those and you can answer those questions. Those are gonna help you tremendously on the exam. And then again, if you scroll all the way down, let me just make sure this is published. Um, yeah, so again, all the way at the bottom, there's formulas for exam two, and you can print those out and use those for the exam. All right, if you have any questions, hit me up at office hours or send me a um, an email, and I can try to answer it that way. Otherwise, uh, you know, you have external tools that you can use uh, for the course, and let me just make sure that's listed here. So online tutoring, uh, there's a link there and you can use that as well um, to help me answer questions if I'm not available. All right, uh, good luck on exam two. Um, and uh, I'll see you for the next lecture.